Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the uh, a regular meeting to, of the San Bernardino County Board of Supervisors, <laughs> April 3rd. It's a little after 9, but uh, can we all rise and pledge allegiance, led by Supervisor De La Cruz? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Ready? So I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Can I have a motion for acknowledgement of a certificate of posting? So move. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Hearing no opposed, so that, that passes. Uh, the first thing we got to do is go in closed session for a couple of minutes. Um, won't take long, I'm sure. Uh, County Council. A closed session conference with legal counsel anticipated litigation, significant exposure to litigation pursuant to section 54956.9, number of cases one, authorized by subdivisions D2 and E1 of 54956.9. We'll make it as quick as possible. We'll be right back.
Okay. Uh, uh, the board apologizes for taking a little longer than I thought. Um, but anyhow, uh, County Council, would you like to report out? No reportable action. Okay, thank you. Um, now we'll move on to um, public comment. Uh, oh, I no, I'm have, sorry. Uh, presentations. Uh, presentations, presentations and recognitions. And the first one is Health and Human Services uh, Agency of, with the proclamation of uh, Public Health Week in Samuel County. Uh, Supervisor Medina, would you have the plat, uh, plat bridge? Sure. Thank you. Proclamation is National Public Health Week. Whereas the week of April 2nd through the 8th, 2018, is National Public Health Week, and the theme is changing our future together. And whereas since 1995, the American Public Health Association, through its sponsorship of National Public Health Week, has educated the public policymakers and public health professionals about issues important to improving the public health. There's a lot more to say, but what I'll do is I'll let these uh, three individuals talk a little bit because uh, they're a little bit more versed into what uh, this is all about. Ma'am? Thank you, sir. Good morning. I'm Dr. Gail Newell. I'm your health officer for San Benito County, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about this year's National Public Health Week. Let me get my PowerPoint up here. All right, so welcome to healthy San Benito County. Um, and as you've just heard, this has been declared National Public Health Week in our county as well as nationwide. And one of the things I'm gonna tell you about today toward the end of my little photo journey I'm gonna take you on is our county health ranking. Our health ranking is released every year, um, sponsored by Robert Wood Johnson Foundation in cooperation with the American Association for Public Health. And um, I'll tell you about how San Benito did as we progress here. Um, but let me tell you a little bit about the theme for this year, and that's the Healthiest Nation 2030, Changing Our Future Together. We're working towards guidelines that have been set at the federal level for Healthy People 2030. We're already looking beyond 2020. And um, we're looking through a frame you can see there of much more than traditional health matters. We're looking at education and economic status and where you live because we know that place matters and um, many other factors that play into our health. And we're looking to become the healthiest nation in one generation. So yesterday, Monday, we focused on behavioral health, and we're looking to advocate and promote well-being. Um, you may or may not know, but um, federal law requires us to begin to look at behavioral health or mental health in the same way as we do physical health. So there's health parity laws, which mean that physical health and mental health are going to be reimbursed at the same rates, which we hope will increase access to behavioral health and mental health services. Here in San Benito County, we've had some very exciting developments this past year since I was at the podium talking about National Public Health Week. Um, probably uh, our biggest landmark is that um, we opened the new homeless center and we're launching whole person care, which allows us to use federal Medicaid dollars for things like housing and social services because we know that those so greatly impact our physical health as well. So here you can see um, our dignitaries at the ribbon cutting. And um, I was here in August talking with the supervisors about the opioid crisis nationally as well as locally. 
and um, we formed an opioid task force, which has been a cross-disciplinary collaborative group that's been very active. Supervisor Rivas has been serving on that task force. Thank you very much, and thank you all for your support, and we're making some big changes and strides. Um, through a grant through the state of California, we're now connected into a statewide opioid network where we, we're getting technical and um, advisory support as well as some uh, Avista volunteer staffer um, who will help us move forward on the agenda to um, target prescription and street opioid misuse. And um, thirdly, our, our third um, effort in collaboration with behavioral health has been doing some partnership at the Esperanza Center and um, very exciting uh, federal grant through HRSA um, has given funding for an LGBTQ plus um, support center there and we partnered with them for their Palentine's Day event um, focusing on self-love and health and happiness and you can see there's some of our staff working with them um, that's called the smoothie bike where people power is used to run a blender to, to uh, make healthy smoothies we had a lot of fun <laughs> So this is kind of today, communicable disease focus is kind of the bread and butter or the traditional public health um, mode that we've been in for over 100 years now. And um, so we're focusing today on learning about ways to prevent disease transmission. So best ways, wash your hands, sneeze into your elbow. Um, flu season is still upon us. We had an outbreak of flu at one of our skilled nursing facilities over this weekend. The Centers for Disease Control got involved. Um, we had some patients hospitalized and two more deaths um, from flu in our county. And um, so we want to continue to be vigilant and about flu. It's not too late to get your flu vaccine. As you know, Flu Vaccination Clinic is one of our big efforts that um, our county supports here. And we had great turnout this year, over 600 people immunized in one afternoon. And um, this is an intake area. It was a beautiful day. Lots of people came out. And um, here's some of our happy team helping to um, not only vaccinate for flu, but in addition doing some general health screenings and also practicing our emergency preparedness techniques. <laughs> that was only acting, it doesn't hurt. <laughs> and so um, if you'd like to still get a flu vaccine, it's not too late. The flu season is still upon us. We've gone through the A strain, but now we've got the B strain and a flu vaccine will help. And we're still accepting walk-ins Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, 8.30 to 4. Tomorrow we're focusing on environmental health, working to protect and maintain a healthy planet. And in addition, our local environmental health folks work hard to protect you with your water sources, your septic systems, pools, and food. And um, as we know, we have a beautiful, beautiful county here. The 14 months I've been working here now, I feel really embraced by the community and have learned to very much love and appreciate the natural beauty as well as the people. And um, we need to protect our planet for um, farming, for ranching. Here, I got to attend the rodeo this year. That was super fun. And um, this is, uh, besides a beautiful sunset, also um, a photo of some of the traffic I drive in every day. And um, that's one of the areas that has dropped for us um, our health rankings, is that we're still driving farm roads as if they were freeways. So um, we've got some road work we need to do if we're going to improve our public health. We have too many fatal accidents, too much driving under the influence, too many unharnessed, unrestrained kids in vehicles. So one way that we can get out of our vehicles is to promote walking. This was Public Health Week last week when we did, or last year when we did a walk for wellness. And uh, here's kids at the park where we were promoting good, healthy, safe nutrition and providing some of our, our years, the summer's goodness as well to the kids. 
On Thursday, we'll be looking at injury and violence prevention, and um, that includes things like opioid overdoses and work safety, as well as prevention of violence. There's lots of great community partners that we work with to work on violence prevention and injury prevention in the community. And again, back at Kids in the Park, um, everyone comes together, gives away bicycles. We learn about bicycle safety, bicycle helmets. And all the first responders are there, including San Benito County Sheriff, and they've all got their vehicles open and the lights on, and the kids get to climb in and out of the vehicles and take a look. And, and uh, we have fire and paramedics and the library and all kinds of folks there um, sharing their um, resources with the kids. We also later in the summer um, do migrant health fairs, so we go out to the migrant camps and do um, health and safety with them. And they, here you see a bicycle helmet fitting and some mosquito bite prevention. And lastly on Friday is about ensuring the right to health and advocating for everyone's right to a healthy life. So we work with the press, we work with our local agencies, our community partners, um, our safety net providers, Hazel Hawkins Memorial Hospital, where I've gotten to deliver some babies this year and um, work with some uh, and develop relationships with physician colleagues, which have been invaluable. And they have such a great safety net of community clinics who provide excellent care to our county residents. And of course, the San Benito Health Foundation, our federally qualified health center, open to all comers. And we've got all kinds of community advocates, including our young people in the community. So how did we do on our county health rankings? Well, let me tell you a little bit about how we get the data, and this is a hard slide to see, but you'll see the green on the top is health outcomes. That's the main ranking. It's a 50% score based on our length of life, how long people are living in the county, and the quality of life. And then we also get ranked on health factors, including healthy behaviors like tobacco use, diet and exercise, alcohol and drug use, sexual activity, our STD rates. We look at clinical care, so our access to care and quality of care, and then social and economic factors like high school graduation rates and employment and income. And lastly, the physical environment with air and water quality as well as housing and transit. And here's the news on our health outcomes, length of life and quality life. We were ranked number 19 out of 57 rated counties. So not too bad, we're in the second quartile, um, about the same as last year when we were ranked 17th and the year before we were 24th. So um, we're, still, we're still in that uh, better than average rate. Health factors, we dropped a little bit this year and we're at uh, 24 out of 57 rated counties. And um, you can see, as might be predicted there, the darker the color, the, the worse the health factors or the worse the likelihood for a healthy life in our area. Mm -hmm. You can see the Central Valley is very dark, so our neighboring counties, um, a lot of poverty and, and lack of education, not great access to healthy foods there, ironically. Um, and then our Bay Area counterparts up there is all pretty white, so wealth brings health. Um, and we're in the middle there between the Central Valley and the Bay Area, kind of predictable, but again in the second quartile. So as we celebrate healthy San Benito County, we're going to celebrate this week the power of prevention. Wash your hands, get your flu shots, sneeze into your elbow. Um, we're going to advocate for healthy and fair policies, build successful partnerships with our community partners, and champion the role of a strong public health system. And on that note, the strong public health system, I'm going to turn the podium over to Deputy Director of Public Health Services, Lynn Mello, and she's going to share the exciting news about our move in just a couple of weeks to our new location. Thank you, Dr. Newell. Honorable Board, Chairman Botello, thank you for your time and attention today. 
This is an update on our public health services building relocation project that's been in process for a few years now. Our current building at 439 4th Street dates back to the 1940s or possibly earlier. I searched for historical images of the 400 block of 4th Street, but none were available from the historical society. We're located next door to the former jail, and like the old jail, the building contains asbestos. A complete remodel with abatement would have been cost prohibitive and far too disruptive to operations. Numerous modifications have been made over the years to accommodate the addition of staff, uh, but we reached capacity years ago. The roof is compromised. The building has numerous cracks in its structure. The electrical system is antiquated. There's no HVAC system. The plumbing is impaired, and the staff is crowded together into small cluttered spaces. And I think a few of you came over and took a look at our building and, and noticed that as well. Uh, we've endured roof leaks, floods, and near electrical fire. We do not meet HIPAA, fire, and building code regulations. The building is not conducive to worker productivity, nor does it send a message of efficiency to our clients and partners. Our vaccine refrigerator stores over $50,000 worth of vaccines, and it is imperative that we have a reliable electrical system and power backup in the event of a power failure. Public notice of our move will be posted by signage on our building through a press release, through mass mailings and faxes to our healthcare and community partners, and through social media outlets. Our banner at 4th Street will change from we are moving to 351 Trespinos Road to we have moved after April 20th. Public appointments will be halted during the weeks of April 16th and 23rd with the exception of death certificates and um, disease outbreak response. Our ribbon cutting will take place on May 1st at 1.30 p.m. We've obtained a food permit from Environmental Health, so we'll have healthy refreshments. <laughs> Daryl wouldn't let us uh, do it without a food permit. Um, our new location at 351 Trespinos Road, Suite A202, is the former Fortino's Furniture Store and is located next to our community partners, YMCA and First Five San Benito. The new Public Health Services building is conveniently located among businesses and residences, has a welcoming lobby for the public, has easy access, has plenty of parking, and provides double the space of the 4th Street location. And during construction, uh, numerous windows were uncovered under drywall, and so now we have spectacular views of the um, surrounding mountains. We have state-of-the-art ergonomic workstations, a roomy conference room, breakout areas for group work, client consultation rooms, sufficient storage space, and an immunization clinic room where vaccines can be given safely and safely stored with a power backup in the event of a power outage. An integral part of the renovation upgrades for public health are the communications and data infrastructure components. Public health will have improved technology, including Wi-Fi access points and greater data and network security. Technologies include secure supported network hardware, a secured wireless network, internet access, and a digital phone system using voice over internet protocol, or VoIP. The network environment maximizes flexibility and scalability to accommodate current and future growth of the public health division. We are very excited to make this transition that's long overdue. San Benito families and business partners will arrive at a welcoming and vibrant department that sends a message that they are valued and cared for in the most efficient and professional way. They are passionate and dedicated to making their community and world a healthier place. This new location stimulates a renewed energy and enthusiasm in the public health team. I'd like to thank my boss, Jim Ridingsword, for pursuing us in this project. Thanks, Jim. <laughs> and thank you, Chairman Botello, for hearing me out at the pancake breakfasts. And I'd especially like to thank the Building Relocation Project team, Adam Goldstone, Cynthia Larca, Mike Hodges, Maria Barrientos, Sacramento Viacana, and Brian Gordon 
for their hard work and dedication in making this vitally important project come to fruition. And so here are a couple of videos that illustrate our transition. Hmm, I can't see it on the... Oh, maybe it's the mouse. Okay. Are we seeing it? Okay. There we go. Let's go to the Yeah. Okay. Okay. This is our old building. That's the old jail. <laughs> our lobby. Our clerical area, you can see how we're cramped in there. We have a vaccine freezer in the uh, break room. And that's the nurse's office. And now our new building Over at 351 Trespinos, A202. And thank you very much. Thank you. And we'll see you at our ribbon cutting on May 1st, 1.30 p.m. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you very much for that presentation. Now we'll move on to the next presentation, a proclamation proclaiming a uh, uh, the week of April 8th through 14th as National Library Week, and Supervisor De La Cruz has that one. Thank you, Monsieur. Uh, Nora, you want to come? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, members of the board, and thank you for the public for allowing me to make this proclamation today. Uh, again, proclamation for the National Library Week of April 8th through the 14th, 2018. Whereas libraries are not just about what they have for people, but what they do for and with people. And whereas libraries have long served as trusted, treasured institutions, playing a vital role in supporting the quality of life in our community, and whereas libraries lead the way in leveling the playing fields for all who seed information and access to, to technology, and whereas libraries provide transformative opportunities for education, employment, entrepreneurship, empowerment, and engagement, and whereas, and whereas, and whereas, and now, therefore, let it be resolved that the San Bernardino County Board of Supervisors proclaim National Library Week April 8th through the 14th, 2018. We encourage all San Benito County residents to visit the San Benito County Free Library this week to explore the resources, services, and program the library has to offer. Because of you and our library leaders, libraries transform. Thank you, Nora. Congratulations.
Thank you so very much, uh, board members and members of the public. We are pleased. Please come and visit our, your library. We're here to serve you. We're there for you to try to meet your needs. Uh, the staff and I welcome to provide service for you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Nora, if, if you can, uh, why don't you stay right there and help me with the, the next item that we have, which is to uh, present teen volunteers with a certificate of appreciation for their service at the San Mateo County Library. And what I'll, I have a list of names, and I, I know some of our volunteers are here uh, this morning. And if I'm going to come to the podium and announce your names, and if you want to just line up right here in the front, and, and we'll do the presentation like that. Library uh, volunteers, if you will stand and come forward and line up at the front. Ladies and gentlemen, these are the library volunteers, uh, some of which are here, some of which could not make it this morning, but I'd like to let you know that Represented here are not only in the hundreds of hours, but with some of them, they're in the thousands. These children, now young people and teens, have helped the library in many, many capacities where they have helped plant a love of, see a love of reading and a love of literacy in the lives of our young people and also our adults that come to visit the library. As Ms. Conte uh, was stating, you know, we all have a responsibility to volunteer in our community. Whether you're an adult or a, a young person, find your interests, make your community better by volunteering, and it is a better place uh, if you do that. And um, on behalf of the Board of Supervisors, we are very appreciative of the work that you do, and we can't have a successful library without it, really. So uh, this is a certificate of press, uh, appreciation that the San Bernardino County Library volunteer volunteers for 2018. In recognition of a job well done for your service, you are a role model who demonstrates dedication and commitment to the promotion of literacy and a lifelong learning. Lifelong learning, that's really great. With profound gratitude and appreciation on behalf of the Board of Supervisors, uh, we thank you. So I have a list of names. I hope I have them all yes. here. And I'm going to do my best to pronounce it right. <laughs> uh, Maggie Arias. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Ariana, Ariana, Ariana uh, Fabian. Fabian. <laughs> Thank you very much. I should have brought my glasses. Ladicia Henry. <laughs> Thank you very much. Vivian Hernandez. Thank you. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> Nina Jurgensen. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ezekiel Lario. All right. Thank you. That's you. <laughs> we have Alex Munoz. Sophie Munoz. <laughs> Thank you very much. Odellis Garcia. Thank you. Jennifer Laz Lazardi. <laughs> Thank you very much. This is yours, I hope. Yep. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. And Jacob Rivera. Thank you, Jacob. That's our volunteers for this year. 
Uh, uh, Board members, um, members of the public that are here and those that are watching us at home, this is our leadership for the future, and they're there. They've been there, and they will continue to be there. Some of the volunteers that are not volunteers that are not here today is because they're in college now, but they're here in spirit, and they couldn't make it uh, to be here with us. But thank you. I value you so much. Without you, we could not do summer reading. Without you, we could not do the holiday programs that we do. Without you, we could not do National Library Week. And without you, we could have not been able to go forward. I appreciate every moment, every second, every hour that you stood, stood fast there with your library, leading the way to a love of reading and lifelong learning. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. We appreciate you. Okay, we'll move on to our public comment section of our meeting. Uh, I have speaker cards. Marga Conteo. This is the ADA more of the John Smith. <laughs> Uh, my name is Barbara Tadeo. I live at 575 Heatherwood Estates Drive here in Hollister, which is right off of John Smith. And what I'm talking about first this morning is the condition, um, deplorable condition, of which John Smith is in at the present time. Um, there were so many potholes in just a short section that I couldn't even take pictures of them all. Otherwise, when I have come before you before, this was a couple years ago before you put the one section, you, you paved part of the section going up the road to the dump. That's fine. But it's the section after you turn off of Fairview onto John Smith that the semis that are coming with garbage from out of county are destroying the road. But they're not only destroying the road, they're destroying our cars. Um, I've had to put new shocks on my car in less than three years. Um, I've had numerous, numerous, it's a big joke down at San Benito Tire. They say, well, yeah, we get about four or five people a day coming in with flat tires from the nails that are still on the road uh, from trash being taken to John Smith. What happens is they hit the potholes and the stuff flies off the trucks. Um, we've got to do something. We've got to pave that section of John Smith. I know they were going to put an alternative uh, road in, but financially it would be cheaper just to pave what you've got. Like I said, there's so many potholes. You can't even um, draw. Well, I counted 50 new potholes in this last uh, storm. 50 in just a small section, something. You've got to pave that section of the road. And my problem is the problem of all of us that live in the area that are so disgusted from all of the, the nails in our tires and the damage to our cars, something's got to be done. Um, thank you. Okay. My Let's next on one. one. Sure, we're gonna talk on the next one. Um, as a disabled um, senior that lives here in the county, I went, my, again, do you want me to give my name again for the record or not? Okay. Um, I had to go up to Vital Records to get some information last Friday and was appalled to think that the way that the signage is and getting to the second floor is in so much violation of the ADA. How do I know about the ADA? One of the things when I worked for Stanford University as a facilities manager, I was responsible for making the accommodations to the buildings that I was responsible for under the ADA. Um, it took me five minutes to get up the staircase. The signage, if you park in handicap parking, there's a sign there that points you to the elevator that's behind locked doors. It is surprising to me that this county has not been sued big time by one of these attorneys that goes around suing small businesses or even public buildings 
um, because of ADA violations. This is in so much of a violation, it's crazy. What you have to do is that I finally, after making up the staircase, she goes, oh yeah, there's a buzzer downstairs by the staircase. Well, it's the opposite staircase where the sign is. And then she goes, well, there's a, you can call the number that's listed on the door. Well, I, one of the things that I do is I, I help senior citizens that are much older than I am who don't have cell phones. And so to say, well, just call the number at the bottom when they don't have a cell phone and they're trying to get upstairs, it's just nuts. So you've got to improve that. And also the small buzzer that supposedly it's a portable buzzer that's down by the staircase when the vital records is open is way too small visually for anyone who's visually impaired, let alone being physically impaired to get up the staircase. You've got to put two buzzers near both of those uh, staircases and you've got to make the signs much, much larger. And like I said, I tried going down, you know, following the sign saying handicap entrance, and it took me to a locked door. So before you get sued by some happy-go-lucky attorney out there, these uh, things have to get uh, resolved. And um, like I said, it was sheer frustration trying to get up the staircase to get the records that I needed to pick. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I appreciate those comments a, a lot. Uh, next speaker. Good morning. My name is Cynthia Abrams, and it's kind of apropos that we are here as caregivers from the SEIU Union. I didn't know it was care, um, Health Week. I wouldn't say Caregiver Week, but the jobs that we do encompasses mental health, physical health, and so I'm happy that it's this week that we're here. Because we just want to remind you of the work we do so that we are valued in the um, community and for the people we take care of, that they get value. I have a 47-year-old epileptic autistic son that I take care of. And we're paid certain hours a month, which is great. But we work so many more hours because... Like my son, you don't know when a seizure is going to occur. I mean, just this last weekend, in the middle of the night, he has one, and then he has another. And then we go to the Toyota dealer, and he has one in the parking lot of the Toyota dealer. Luckily, we had wonderful personnel there that helped us and got him back in our car. But we people here that we're represent representing so many different kinds of people we take care of, family members, outside the home people and we just couldn't <laughs> we couldn't even begin to get paid for what we do we know that but we know that what we do is important and saves so much more to the community in financial assistance and it's just what I wanted to say and also I'm happy to hear of those young people who take the library and volunteer time that helps everybody as well so just to remind you that we are caregivers. We in love our family. We love our people that we take care of. And we just want you to know the value of it. So thank you all. Thank you very much. Good morning, Board of Supervisors. Good morning. Um, I'm going to read an email that I sent to AMR uh, Ambulance this uh, weekend. And oh, you could, it's Pat, gave it, give it to it our clerk. So you can read along if you like. <laughs> or rather, Janet will give you copies. <laughs> On a beautiful day in San Juan Batista at 1.15 p.m. on Saturday, March 31st, with children running in and out of local shops collecting Easter eggs from the merchants, an AMR ambulance pulled up in the red zone beside a fire hydrant, partly in the crosswalk, 
and parked against the flow of traffic on 3rd Street at Washington. Two women, in no hurry, got out of the ambulance, and my husband, who was sitting outside waiting for me to order a sandwich, asked the driver if there was an emergency. Without answering, both women headed across Washington Street towards Hardeen's. I came out of the sandwich shop on the corner and wrote down the plate, <coughs> 8J73611, an ambulance number, 07835. Fifteen minutes later, as we were eating our sandwich, the two women returned with a takeout bag. I stated to the driver, this did not appear to be an emergency, and I would re be reporting the incident. Again, no answer from the women. Count the number of vehicle code violations here. Red zone, fire hydrant, crosswalk, facing vehicle against the flow of traffic. Add the fact that this is a busy Saturday with many children possibly more focused on collecting eggs from the merchants than the traffic to the fact that no vehicle coming off of Washington Street could safely see around the ambulance and these AMR employees have created an extremely unsafe situation for no good reason. Did I mention there was parking available on Washington Street? In addition to sending this email to AMR, my local county supervisor, and the San Juan city manager and mayor, I plan on contacting the Hollister Freelance, I haven't done that yet, the full board of supervisors, I'm doing that today, and the full city council. I believe their next meeting is on the 17th. Just because it can be difficult to immediately find a San Benito County Sheriff's deputy to ticket a multiple violation of this nature is no reason why our local first responders should not follow all safety precautions, especially when the only emergency is lunch. Um, did I mention I'm Jolene Cosio from San Juan? Uh, at any rate, I wouldn't make such a big deal about it, except I've seen it before not just from ambulance drivers, from fire truck drivers who are going to lunch. And I am a big supporter of emergency responders. And when there's an emergency, this morning I pulled over on coming here because there was a, a um, police officer with his lights on going towards right. San Juan. Um, you know, of course. Yeah. And right. I will stay out of their way. And I don't mind if there's an emergency, but lunch is not an emergency, and we need to stay on these employees. Thank you. I can't agree more. Any next speaker? Uh, good, good morning, board. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Cesar Sanchez with the Home Care Providers Union, SEIU Local 2015. Um, I think Cynthia said it better, but... Um, at the best, uh, caregivers provide very important work to our community. Uh, they provide dignity and respect and allow consumers to stay at home while they provide important care. Um, the work that they do res uh, results in um, better health results in our community. Um, thank you, board, and please continue to invest in the IHSS program. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Hi, my name is Kevin Barcelos. I live at 1121 Cabrillo Drive. We've lived in Hollister for the last eight years. Some of you might know me and my wife, Kim, from our involvement with the Hollister Animal Lost and Found Facebook group, currently at over 3,500 members. Last year, we helped reunite over 500 animals to their owners without ever having to enter the shelter. Whether it's rallying to locate a lost dog, rushing a critically sick stray cat to the vet, or even helping a grieving family with cremation expenses, we see every day that our community places a very high value on the welfare of its animals and their families. So it's with sadness today that I come before you, because over the last several months it has become increasingly clear that the Hollister Animal Services Department is not operating in a way that reflects those values. In November, our community was shocked to learn of the findings of the grand jury report. For the first time hearing of the shelter's euthanasia rate, which was a staggering 48%. That's more than double the rate of our neighbors. And then we were dismayed at the city's response. 
which seem more interested in avoiding blame than acknowledging the extent of the euthanasia problem, let alone proposing ways to solve it. And then, just a few weeks ago, there was an identical response by HPD to the story of Cooper. He was a six-month-old puppy, euthanized after being quarantined as a dangerous dog, despite all evidence to the contrary. We saw more blame shifting and truth shaving, which galvanized us into action. The trust of the community is important for any government function, and in our case, that trust has been completely shattered. So today, I'm here representing the Hollister Animal Services Reform Group. We're barely two weeks old, and we're already comprised of nearly 500 highly motivated members, split evenly between Hollister City and County residents. Our group is determined to find ways to align the Animal Services Department with our values so that trust can be reestablished. We expect transparency, accountability, and the establishment of a vision for the department that will leverage the pent-up volunteer energy that is waiting to be harnessed here. Actually, we don't just expect it, we demand it. The thing is, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. The models for successful animal services delivery exist in our neighboring counties, and there is no reason other than organizational inertia that they can't be implemented here. Just walk into the shelter in Santa Cruz or San Martin, and within minutes, you can feel the difference in the atmosphere. And this is also borne out in the statistics. So whether we adopt the best practices of our neighbors in the current animal services department, or join a joint powers authority with one of them, our community will not rest until it's confident that its values and its priorities are being represented. To that end, we'll be reaching out to each of you, individually and as a group, to discuss potential countywide solutions and agree on a path forward. The time to act is now. Thank you for your time and attention. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for your work and pr presentation. Thank you. Marty Richmond. Good morning, uh, Marty Richmond from Hollister. Uh, you've heard a lot of different subjects this morning. I didn't hang around to be last. I was just too lazy to get up and turn my uh, slip in. Uh, but many of them come down to the same issue, and that is uh, resources, and resources is a code word for money. We would do a lot of things if we had the money. And uh, that, that f from fixing the roads to doing a better job in the animal shelter, to uh, being able to afford to uh, support more home health care at a higher rate. We could do all kinds of things if we had the resources, the money, and we don't have it. And that's what's going on in the state of California. Basically, there's a huge, uh, you saw the picture uh, from uh, Dr. Newell who said, what you say? Uh, wealth makes health, I believe were her exact words. I wasn't prepared for that. That's, a, that's, an interesting, uh, that's an interesting take from someone in the public health area. Wealth makes health. It, it's, it happens to be true. You know, I'm undergoing some, uh, some treatments, and uh, I'm, I happen to have two insurances, so I'm well covered. And so I have no problem. I go up there, and I'm going to get my treatment, and someone's going to pay for it because I'm doubly insured Took me took me a couple of decades to earn that. It didn't come didn't come easy, but uh, people without access are going to have more problems, and that goes for everything. Basically, when they come, people come to you. You would do it if you had unlimited funds, and and you should do it immediately. Your ADA uh, issues at the, at the old building. I'm sure you, there'd be somebody working on it this morning. Say, oh, we we bought all this stuff. And whatever. So what I encourage you to do is figure out a way to <coughs> put revenue at the top of your list. Now, before anybody calls me a money grubber, I don't want the money for me. But all the things you want to do cost money. That's the way it is. Okay? And the state of California is not going to give us a break because we happen to be poor. Because the grants... They all sound great because there's a dollar here and a dollar there, but the truth of the matter is when you add it all up, it doesn't run the county, okay? So you've got to figure out a way if you want to survive 
and be in the, unfortunately, be above the crack that's coming into the state between the rich and the poor, you're going to have to find a way to get some more revenue. I don't know what the answer is. I would have liked it to be more business because they bring revenue with them. If you don't believe me, just look at Santa Clara County. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, would anyone else like to uh, comment to the Board of Supervisors on items not on the agenda this morning? Okay. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. Uh, my name is Richard Perez, Sr. And I'm here to advocate for our youth center, but also to advocate for a new, a new library. Uh, the resources that Marty was talking about in re building a revenue stream, I think can become a reality if we invest in our young people. That's what we need to do. As you can see, we have plenty of volunteers for the library, but we have to start building sustainable infrastructure that's going to help bring those entrepreneurial skills to Hollister. That is where I think our biggest revenue stream can come. It's an untapped resource. So if we can build a youth center with some of the after school programs that I would like to see, I think we can generate enough interest in building businesses that will help sustain an economic base. So my proposal to the Board of Supervisors is to really look at investing in the infrastructure with libraries and with a youth center and possibly partnering with the Economic Development Administration in building entrepreneurial skills and brain, brain trust and brainstorming some of these alternatives. So that's all I have to say. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, with that, I'll close public comment and, and move on to uh, Department Head Announcements, uh, CAO Espinosa. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, we have an announcement out, out of um, the library. Library has been the topic of the day. So we have Nora Conte, our librarian here. Okay, yeah, got it. Good morning, board members, members of the public. Aaron and I, Aaron is um, my assistant uh, in the county, a library, and I asked her to come up because. She is going to be working with me on National Library Week. I'd like to let you know that on April the 11th, we're going to be launching distance learning. That is um, the ability for individuals to use their digital devices from wherever they're at, whether they are at school, whether in the office, whether out on vacation, and you're researching whether it be a school assignment or creating a business or wanting to know more information about your business and you f have located an article that you would like to print, you can print it from your digital device, send it to the library, and you can come to your public library using your library card and you will be able to access that document. So if you don't have access to a printer, your public library is there and available so that you can send your print job there and come and have a printed copy of it. We will launch this April the 11th at 12 noon. So um, I wanted to alert you to that. Please come visit the library uh, during National Library Week. It's April the 11th that we'll be celebrating. We'll have from 10 to 4.30, we'll have story times, crafts. We'll have open house, the launching of the mobile print. We're also inviting the public to come to lunch and learn. If you would like to learn about how to download e-books, audio books, or print from your mobile digital device, we'll be able to provide instruction for that uh, to be happening. Also, on this day, it's a bookmobile month. Book, excuse me, Bookmobile Day. So the Bookmobile will be out there as well with refreshments and we'll have programs for the children. I wanted to also let you know that in September we will be celebrating the 100th anniversary of our library. What we will be launching during that time, and I will be telling you more about this as time goes on, we have digital uh, 3D printers and we are going to be able to launch those so that when you come into your public library and you would like to create 
um, from using materials and doing anything from a bracelet to a, a little animal or even even a, a shoe or a small model of a building, you'll be able to do that. So we will be launching that as well in September when we celebrate our 100th uh, anniversary. Erin, do you have anything else to share? I don't think so. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Board. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Chair, we also have another announcement out of administration. April the 10th, if you can say this in your calendars, uh, 9 a.m., we have a special board meeting for budgets. So I just wanted to make sure the board was aware of that. This, this go around, we're going to be discussing OPEB, Teeter, uh, CAFR, um, as well as the budget process. So um, we also have another announcement. County Council has one. On agenda item number. Uh, four, it's been m modified and corrected to indicate that it has a not to exceed amount of 25000 Thank you. Those are all the announcements, Mr. Chair. Okay. All right. Um, we'll move on to board announcements. I'll start in the other direction today. Uh, Supervisor Rivas? Nothing, Mr. Chair. Supervisor Munzer? Nothing. Supervisor De La Cruz? Nothing. It's all up to you, Supervisor Medina, although I have something. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. I have nothing. All right. Well, uh, it would have been a clean slate, but for, uh, I last week uh, took a tour of the jail. Uh, I know Supervisor Munster has taken that tour recently, and I, I want to thank Captain Bradley and um, Captain LaMonica for taking the time and uh, taking me around the jail. I haven't seen the inside of it. Uh, ever, but uh, I, I've seen it. You've seen it. <laughs> I've seen it, but not uh, in a bad way. <laughs> and uh, but I, I encourage my colleagues uh, to and you know other staff uh, take that tour and see what type of work that really needs to be done. And we got to start, you know, not only thinking about the new jail, but also some investment in the old jail um, as well. I also want to thank uh, um, Director Riding Sword for his efforts. Uh, it's been painstaking uh, working, trying to work on this homeless issue in, in our uh, county and our, our, our city. Uh, he's put together a, a, you know quite a few uh, key staff people, key departments that I really appreciate their uh, work. There's a lot to be done. As far as uh, you know, we're not uh, resolved a homeless problem, but we're, we sure could make a you know, improvement in people's lives. Uh, not only the homeless, but those of us that are businesses and and individuals that are affected by you know folks that are in our community without you know places to go. With that, I'm I'm done with my report. I'm gonna go back to Supervisor De La Cruz before we move on. Yeah, and I apologize to the board and to the public, but I think it's important. I, I met with Dr. Rose, president of Galvin College, yesterday, and you know, bottom line, she asked me for my support because they're trying to put another bond. And I and I told him straight out, I go, look, I was a Galvin College trustee back in 2004. I was part of that group that that brought the idea of a Measure E. And there were concessions, concessions that were going to be made, such as how much money was going to be given back to San Bernardino County. And today, those dollars are not there. And, and I told straight out Dr. Rose, I don't know if I can support it today. Uh, I believe that you need to bridge out to the community first and then ask me later. But as it stands right now today, it's, it's a no deal. Uh, there's a lot of relationship and a lot of uh, broken promises that need to be rebuilt back in the community. And I told Australia, look, San Benito County will probably be 10% of the vote. Why do you need San Benito County's vote? You just go ahead and do it. And she said, no, we need San Benito County to buy into the idea of doing a bond in November. So I said, well, good luck. Uh, as of today, I can't support the concept. So I think it's important that the board knows that Dr. Rose is reaching out to all the members of the community. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Chairman. Um, with that, we'll move on to a consent agenda. Any supervisors would like to pull any of the items? Number three. Number three. 
Um, five. Number five. <clears throat> Any other items? Anyone from the public would like to pull any items? Seeing none, um, I have item three and five to pull and a modification to item four. I'll entertain a motion. So moved, Mr. Chair. Second, Mr. Chair. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Hearing, oppose, hearing none, we'll go to item uh, number three. Su uh, Supervisor Medina. Yes. I pulled this last uh, time also because I'm still not 100% uh, like to see that drafted and, and once again this is all based upon staff time and that's what I'm worried about right so um, we will be bringing as part of the fee uh, update uh, part of the uh, change to that will be a new fee for exactly what you're talking about for a pre uh, application review uh, what we refer to as a development review uh, committee concept which is done elsewhere but is that based upon a general plan amendment because there's two different things there I'm looking at a general plan amendment versus just a uh, a development that someone wants to will go ahead and do but it's in the residential area so that's, it, that's different than changing the general plan so the development review uh, is to uh, analyze a concept with an application before they come in with an app uh, a full application so that we can identify things whether or not uh, general plan amendment is going to be necessary or <clears throat> water issues, stormwater issues, uh, wastewater issues, anything that, that might be a big uh, hurdle for them to overcome so that we can help address what those issues are before they submit an application. Um, really, otherwise, we don't do any work until an application is received. Uh, once an application is received, then we're obligated to process it, which means that we're obligated to do, do the staff work uh, to do the research, to work with the applicant, and then to take it to hearing. Uh, usually that starts with the, the planning commission. So any general plan uh, amendment would, would require going to the uh, planning commission. And it's really not up to us. If the applicant's willing to pay uh, the fees associated with taking a general plan amendment uh, forward, then we're obligated to do that and take that to hearing. doesn't mean that we recommend approval or recommend denial. That depends on the specific issues. Uh, but we have to do the work 
that gets it to hearing, and we have to do the staff work that uh, gives the hearing body the information that they need to uh, make an informed decision. And this reimbursement agreement simply allows us to recoup our costs from the applicant uh, for exactly what you're talking about, uh, for the staff time that we normally don't re recuperate our costs for because it's prior to an applicant submitting a full application. But yeah, I'm still a little bit confused because what I've read is we can actually not process that application based upon a general plan amendment. If we, if we wish not to do a general plan amendment, we do not have to process that application. That's what I wanted some clarity on. Why don't we uh, work with staff and bring it back to you on the 20th agenda with the options that the board has about adopting a policy that would allow that authority? If, if that's all right with the board here. Uh, Supervisor Rivas. But regardless, I mean, it still has to go through the process. It does. If they, if they have to, if they're going to pursue a general plan amendment, it still has to go through the hearing process. It still has to come to our you know, our board for final approval of that decision. We can't just there have deny been them the opportunity to go through that process. I, I think we should agendize it because we're getting a little bit off. There, there have been some counties and cities that have adopted a policy, a pre-application policy, where they have to come for, for general plan amendments. They have to come and get the board. And I understand that, but that's not yeah, something that's a, we have. No, we don't have it we, right That's now. something that this is that's entirely separate than this. I mean, I understand Mark's position of, you know, making a delay, uh, um, you know, having a delay of this specific item to put that in place first. I understand that, right? I mean, we would have to agendize to create that process, that administrative layer. Okay, that's fine. And I'm not, I'm, 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 I'm willing to do that, but I'm willing to make this approval today and then move forward with making that change, because I think that's going to require a lot of time and effort. So, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chair. Thank you. Mr. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chair? Supervisor De La Cruz. Thank you. Uh, Barbara, the way, I read, the way I read the Supervisor Rio's comments is approve, here, approve this today and then come back and direct staff to come back with a policy on do we want to move forward with now with a, an amendment change, right? Is that correct? Right. That, so, that's just so, a, so this project, I can say this project, it is the project, I'm sorry, this application, because it's not a project yet, this application then bypasses that step because this is first, right? It, it depends, actually, maybe how that's worded. Let's just bring it back with the board. Uh, uh, I, if the board would like me to place that on the agenda for next week, I meant next meeting, we can bring back the different types of policies that we could adopt and how that would affect any um, applications that are pending. But, Mr. Chair, but I thought that today's meeting but was. But let's move to forward with this one because we're recommending that this one be approved now, because um, you know staff is still having to incur expenses, and also we need to bring forth some reimbursement agreements for other similar projects that staff is currently working on as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, any other comments from the board or questions for Mr. Gervin? Uh, if not, uh, any public comment on this? Uh, seeing none, I'm bringing it back to the board for. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, that, <laughs> maybe I'm too fast. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, good morning, supervisors. Rob Onetto with RJA here, representing the applicant, Bristol Land. Um, it's it's our intention at this time, uh, when an application is filed, is that we intend to conform to the general plan, as written in in the current uh, 2035 general plan for future community areas. Now, part of, I believe, the analysis, if it turns up that staff finds that there is inconsistency with our uh, proposal with the general plan, then I would assume a general plan amendment would be triggered at that time. But the, the vehicle that, if I'm understanding this correctly, through the process established here is that we will be submitting a specific plan that will be implemented, you know, that will help implement the general plan policies, but that um, I'm not sure I'd, I'd leave it up to staff to determine what the actual application is, but our intent is to conform to the general plan, not to require a, an amendment to the general plan. So I hope that that clarifies um, our intention at this point. But again, I think the process still has to be determined by staff. Anthony. Okay. Great. Uh, Supervisor Medina. Yeah, yeah that's, that's my question there. You can't conform to the general plan if it's not residential right now it's agriculture so we have to do a general plan amendment in order to do anything yeah it's kind of a chicken and egg it's determined the general plan now is it determines that the bolsa area is a future community area and there's certain policies in the current general plan that establish what 
what happens in this area and here in the process as as we understand it is that a master plan or a specific plan will have to be prepared for that so you know the the general plan identifies it as a potential area with great flexibility um, i think at the time the intent was to not particularly shoehorn anything but to leave it to a future application to determine what's appropriate for that area so that is it it's definitely begs the question you know what the general plan as written now identifies a, a kind of loosely bound uh, future growth area that requires a specific plan or master plan. So that's what we're trying to get to that next step to do that and to say that we are a future growth area with all the goals established. I think BOLSA particularly was described as a transit-oriented development area. There's economic opportunity as well as um, to establish a standalone community. So we're trying to fit within, our intent is to fit within the um, the, the goals and policies as written today, understanding that, you know, the board and staff may have, um, you know, as this evolves, as the application evolves, they may have recommendations that would help narrow the, uh, the focus of that to deliver something that the county is expecting. But right now it's agriculture, correct? Uh, well, it's 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 as an underlying, and maybe John can help here, as an underlying land use, but the general plan um, itself does identify it as a future growth area with the intent that you know any new development on this would have to go through a master planning process and that's where we are today so i think the the goal if i'm understanding the goal of the general plan is that th these future growth areas the very what four i think there are right now that there there is a process that each one has to go through and um, and I think even the general plan doesn't even limit it to those areas. I think it's it's written fairly loosely to say or any other areas that may be deemed appropriate for future communities. And the future communities are defined loosely for each one of the four identified areas now. But see, as a developer, would you rather right now know if anyone was in a area that wasn't residential if you have to do a general plan amendment, wouldn't you like to know that before? Well, I, I think that's part of the steps that we're taking right now in, in working with staff is to, to um, identify the proper course for getting through this process. You know, what is the proper application to do that? We do know that the, um, that the policies in the general plan do say a specific plan will be required. We do want to file a specific plan and go through all this necessary CEQA review for that. But also, I think, you know, the, the work that we've been doing with uh, staff up to this point has been really to try to identify the proper pathways to get there and the proper applications and to, um, as why we're here today, and to execute the agreement to augment, you know, the cost of doing this just so we can identify the steps that are necessary. And it could... I'm, I'm assuming it could be, um, I'm not sure what the application is. I don't think the county has a specific application for specific plan. John, you can correct me if I'm, I'm wrong, but um, we just want to get to that next step now. And, and as I said before, you know, interpreting, I think the key thing is interpreting the intent of the existing general plan and to bring an application in, <clears throat> excuse me, that follows the uh, goals and policies and implementation measures for future growth areas. That is the intent now, and if, we, if we're not hitting that target, we want direction so that we can make sure we're hitting that target and meeting the goals of the uh, county. Mr. Chair. Um, I, I think I still have public comment open. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. Okay. And uh, I guess, unless you have a specific... No, oh, no uh, I'll wait till we close. Okay, uh, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Morning, Commissioner Foster. From the discussion, it appears to me we got some some holes in our process. We've got some process in place, and that's the process for that. But it appears it just appears to me from the discussion and, and comments from the county council that we've got some holes in the process, and the count and the county council or county staff has some uh, upcoming proposals on the twentieth, I believe, um, uh, uh, Miss Thompson. On the 20th, did you say it was, that you were going to bring something forward? Uh, 
07? So they, they, they've got some things coming down the pike. Oh, thank you. Um, that will address the holes without any prejudice against any particular project. Just in general, I want to talk about the holes in the, in the process. We need to adopt um, policies that are broadly applicable and cover everything so that five years from now somebody comes in, we're not changing the process because we don't like the fact they want to paint the roof red or we want them to paint the roof red and we have no way of telling them that you have to paint your roofs red. That's the way big organizations have to work. So I do think you need to adopt things that will deal, if you find there's holes in the process, you need to adopt policies that will apply to everybody and everything that address those holes in the process. That's all I wanna say about the future item coming down the track. I have no comment on the processes that currently exist because to be frank with you, I'm not sure what it says. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? I'll close the public comment period. I'll come back to uh, Supervisor De La Cruz. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Barbara, just because we have that area designated the way it is, we, we can still make a motion to deny any applicant, right? The specific plan? Yes. Yeah, we, right. I mean, yes, you'd have to make the, the findings that would be required for a specific plan or area plan, what, what they're bringing forth. I'd have to, I mean, the, we'll, we'll draft that and we'll kind of go into the board's authority and we could see whether we can bring those specific plans into the future policy too, okay. as well as general plan amendments. Okay. Let me make a motion, Mrs. Chair, see if it goes anywhere. I make a motion we deny this application uh, with this, this isn't an application. Yeah. No, I'm sorry. I make a motion that we deny this process and, and to direct staff to come back at the next meeting with um, justifications for, for denial of the process. It's, it's going to, okay. Well, so there's nothing to deny because there's no project before us. Correct. Correct. Um, um, so all we can do is you, we either approve or we do not approve this reimbursement okay. agreement. That's what okay. it is. That's I, th I think um, all the concerns that have been addressed here need to be directed to staff first yes, before right. being vetted up here. Okay. Um, do, I'll, I'll, pull you, back, I'll pull it back, well, Mr. Okay, Chair. good. Thank uh, you. Supervisor Medina. I move that staff stop negotiating with the reimbursement agreement until the county has looked at the policy issues of whether it even wants to entertain a GPA at this time through a GPA screening process. Second the motion. Okay, I have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say no. 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 Uh, three, two fails. Okay. Um, I'll entertain another motion. Mr. Chair, I'll move approval of consent as is uh, item Item four, uh, is it item three? Yes. As is, and then direct staff to come back at a later time to address the, um, you know, administrative process that governs future, um, the development projects or however you guys want to word it. Second. Have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Oppose? No. Here. Two, uh, three, two. Okay, thank you. We'll move on to um, item... Number five, uh, su Supervisor Munzer. Five. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Barbara? Yes. Should I summarize what's happening with this? Yes, would you please? Um, as the board will recall, we had an indemnification agreement with Citadel Incorporated, and there was some litigation involving the approval of the, um, I believe it was Test Wells. Um, and uh, during the course of that CEQA litigation, um, there was an award of t attorney's fees. The county um, incurred that debt and then had to, uh, was trying to proceed against Citadel to recover the 262,000. It was a stipulated or a stipulation entered for the entry of judgment and on page 95 or paragraph five, it indicates Citadel's obligations for this. I'm sorry. It was uh, I'm sorry, page 93, paragraph 2, indicated the obligations that they were to pay 12000 and then payments of 25000 
And then the last uh, lump sum payment was 100000 that's due um, at the end of the first quarter of 2018. Um, presently, we're being approached. Um, uh, another party has deposited $100,000 into the trust account of the attorney that was working with us to collect this debt. And that money is coming from a different party besides Citadel. They would like to pay the $100,000 to the county and then get the assignment of our right to our our rights against Citadel in exchange for that $100,000. So that they're going to be trying to have probably Citadel pay them because they're paying us. And they would like us to assign their rights. We're paid in full. This is our payment of $100,000. But there's still going to be a collection, probably I presume a collection act effort between this new company that's paying us the 100000 and then Citadel. They're probably going to um, have their own deal between the two of them, but they want to have our rights in this stipulation for entry of, of judgment. Um, they want us to assign our rights to them in exchange for them paying us the $100,000. So, so, so we're out of it. We've been paid in full after we collect this 100000 which is sitting in the trust account. Okay, so in, in the... I guess a amendment where it says stipulation for judgment. There's a there's a figure of three hundred twenty seven thousand in right. change. What what is that figure? Um, that was let me go back. Um, that was like um, the total amount. Uh, let me refer to that. Um, there was a, a kind of a a, a judgment. Um, I'm sorry. The it says uh, county shall be entitled to obtain a judgment against the debtor in the the principal amount and then a plus attorney's fees. That's if we had to enter this judgment if they failed to comply with their obligations under the um, under this, then we have the right to enter into the stipulation of judgment. So we have so, not done that yet. No, we have not. So done we're not that. we're not leaving two hundred thousand dollars plus on no. the table. Okay, no. that was my concern. I thought we were. Yeah. All right, thank you. Yep. Okay. Any other questions from the board? No, no sir. No. Any um, public comment? Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the board. Move for staff recommendation. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, hearing none. What we'll do is take a, a 10 minute break <laughs> before break. we move on Come to on a regular agenda. <laughs> Just 10 minutes. Two hours. Two hours to get a 10 minute break. They work over 10 hours, they have to take a time.
<laughs> okay, uh, CEO Espinosa, you could introduce the next regular agenda item. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, this item, as your board's aware, uh, you move forward with uh, the TOT, VLF, and cannabis measures uh, a couple, couple months ago, a month ago or so. And uh, these items were passed as a resolution, actually March 6th, um, last month, and we'll be ready for the June um, ballot. On March 6th, your board did give direction to staff to discuss with COG adding some questions for the general sales tax as well as um, business license fee or tax um, and adding some questions on their polling. Unfortunately, their polling uh, company felt that um, it wasn't best to add any of the questions concerning the general sales tax to their questions. They didn't want to um, misdirect uh, the people that they were polling. Uh, so today, I'm just coming back to your board to give you an update of what transpired in our meeting uh, in regards to your request to add some questions to their polling and request your board, if you would like to move forward with polling, to direct staff that we would work with uh, bringing somebody on and bringing a quote uh, back to your board or in the light of timing, because timing is kind of coming to the, an essence, to just uh, request that you give um, the CAO authorization to move forward with bringing somebody on and, and doing the polling. So I just want to leave that to you. Okay, Mr. great. Thank you. Um, any questions or comments from the board um, on this issue? Um, I, yeah, I guess uh, Supervisor David Cruz, you're, you're a chairman of COG. Yeah. Yeah, Mr. Chair, um, COG is in the process of completing its uh, poll, and I think we're about to get uh, update on, on our next, next COG meeting and I don't know I'm just one member of the COG but I would like to see that transportation road stand, stand alone for the November election um, and but I know that if you guys want to do a poll to do a business and, and sales tax I mean, it's up to the rest of the board members in what directions they want to go okay thank you Su Supervisor David Cruz uh any other comments or no? No, no, it's still no. I haven't done that yet. I'm I'm being patient. Okay. That was a long break. Um, just my comment would be I would I would um uh, uh, agree with directing staff to procure a polling services to to um, see if we do have the support for a general sales tax. Mm -hmm. so. Okay. All right. Um, I guess right now I'll open it up for public comment. Would anyone like from the public would like to comment on this? No. All right. Then I'll, I'll bring it back to the board uh, to provide direction or further comment you know I kind of before we go too too far and expend you know resources into polling I kind of am curious on on the cog poll if we're getting an update they're ahead of us in June and if there's a, a real animosity towards additional taxes maybe that that might be the all we need to know <laughs> so um yep. i think we should maybe put this on ice for for a time being uh, that's my thoughts anyway my, my only question is how long has it taken cog to do their polling three months so and you hopefully will get a report in your april meeting correct so it's we're looking at May before we can make a decision. Perfect timing. May, June, July, August. That's not a whole lot of time before the November election to actually do anything. Which is my only comment. Mm -hmm. Well, my thought is that you know if you have thirty percent of people willing to pay um, a sales tax. 
you know, maybe it's not something that you're, you're go out and, and after, you know, it, if COG's doing a, a poll. Uh, and how much is COG spending on their poll? $27,000. Something like that, yeah. It's not cheap. It's not free. And then it, it, I, I kind of agree with the, you know, Supervisor De La Cruz is if COG puts a sales tax on the ballot in November and, and decides to go forward, um, we, um, you know, maybe don't want to compete with that. And and we are going to get our poll results on, on Thursday, so we'll know more. Um, you know, this week. So, I don't know. I, I think we could hold off at least one more meeting before we, we make a decision. Can we agendize this for the next meeting as Mr. Well? Chair, why don't I look at, um, if, if the chair and the board don't mind, look at um, what it would cost, timing, and look at a few companies, just kind of do some legwork, but don't you know move forward with anything. Okay. And then hear what happens with COG, and then at least we'll have be working on the process, and then if we need yeah, to pull I, the trigger. I, I think that would be yeah. a good idea, and then we have a, uh, an idea of idea. costs yes. and an idea where uh, COG is going, yep. and then we could make a decision yep. uh, one way or the other. Okay. So we'll continue this item yep. to the next meeting. Okay. Thanks, Mr. We'll move on to the next item. We have, a, we have Joe Paul Gonzalez, our uh, controller, auditor, and recorder in elections uh, department head here, and he's going to go ahead and give you uh, an update with regards to the Department of Elections. Good morning, Chair, Board of Supervisors. Today before you as registered voters, I um, wanted to uh, bring this before uh, before you at the, at the last meeting I talked about uh, that you know, we had intentions to bring this presentation before you. And, um, you know, as you know, every other year, the odd years, uh, we don't have elections. And during those odd years, uh, our, our association of elected officials uh, put together trainings. And last year we had a training in, <coughs> in Lake Tahoe. And the, the major part of that training had to do with election security. And it's still a very, very high priority for elections officials. And it's, it's, uh, it's a, you know, high uh, in our list of priorities as we move forward. But, you know, when there's chaos, there's opportunities. And so on the way back from that trip, I was in a car with um, uh, a couple of staff members, and we were kind of brainstorming. In this... You know, in this environment of, you know, election security question marks, um, what can we do to increase uh, voter confidence and voter participation? The one thing that struck out to me the most is that, uh, from the trainings, is that voters still want to vote on paper. This is a they they want to have an actual paper to be able to an hard copy uh to record their vote and so it gave me the idea that you know uh at this time for this election there's going to be about 27 percent of our registered voters are uh are, are uh, going to are supposed to vote at the polls not all of those of course will, will uh will vote at the polls but if people were fearful of, of uh, going to the polls or had anxiety about, you know, their vote won't count, what about if every voter got something in the mail, um, like a uh, sample ballot that they do all the time, but that could be, um, could be used to actually vote? And so... Um, I challenged the, my my staff uh, with the idea that how do we get every everybody a ballot to their households in a way that is follows the law and will help increase voter participation 
and more importantly, voter security. And so this presentation that Angela Curl, Assistant Clerk Auditor Recorder, Register of Voters, um, has done, a, I believe, a, a superb job at, at putting together a uh, kind of the election materials for the, for the for the June election, the June primary, and I think this will be become a standard for uh, all future elections. And so, without any further ado, I present to you Angela Curl and the PowerPoint presentation she's going to provide for you. Thank you, Joe Paul. Good morning, board members, and thank you for letting us speak this morning. Um, I hope everyone received the handout already if you're in the audience, which we don't have as many now, but if you're in the audience, there's handouts at the back table, so if you would like to take one, feel free. I want to make sure. Okay, so um, recently you may have read the San Benito Live article about some procedural changes that Joe Paul's mentioned that we are uh, implementing this election cycle. Some of these changes are based on feedback, not only from our voters, um, from elected officials, from candidates, but also from our election advisory group. We took into account the Center for Civic Design, which is an organization that's trying to standardize voting material across the state and working with election officials. Um, this new uh, mailing that we're going to talk about is only possible because of the new voting system that was approved by the administration and board of supervisors and i'd like to thank you uh, for approving that new voting system so is it gonna, do I have to, it's not going to resume Okay, so um, you may have noticed in the past when you receive mailings, official election mailing logos are on all election material from the Secretary of State's office and from the Department of Elections. This is how you know that this is from an election official as opposed to a campaign or a candidate. The Secretary of State's office does still mail the State Voter Information Guide to each household. This mailing is separate from the county mailings and it contains the statewide propositions and candidate statements for um, state offices. It does not contain local. Um, in the next several weeks, the Secretary of State will begin a mailing sequence over across the state and this guide will be received in each household. It will continue through about the first week of May. Historically, San Benito County has had two types of mailings, and you'll probably recognize these mailings. Uh, one is a separate, the first mailing is the sample ballot voter information guide, which contains all of the local measures and candidate statements and a sample ballot. The second mailing goes out to over 75% of our um, voters that vote by mail or mailing mail ballot precincts, and that's the voter uh, vote by mail packet, and that contains the official ballot and a return envelope. There are 52,000 mailings between these two, and that's a lot of mailing in a very short period of time. Now what we've done is we've combined the two mailings into one called the County Voter Information Guide and Voting Kit. This will go out to the 3,000 registered voters across the county. It will encompass the voter information guide, sample ballot, and an optional voting kit. As you'll see, it's red and white, and it has a, a red logo to stand out to voters to know it's official from our office. But additionally, we put images of the old sample ballot on the front and back of the envelope to catch the eye of the voter so that they know it's from our office. This single mailing will be mailed to all voters, but it'll have two separate inserts. The first insert is for the majority of our voters, which are vote by mail voters, which is 22,000 uh, registered voters. That will be green. And then the polling place voters, which will have an optional vote by mail, um, that'll be 8,000. The green vote by mail voting kit insert explains the changes to this combined mailing. It also explains the new ways of marking your vote by filling in an oval next to the candidate's name. The new look of the return envelope is also um, displayed on this insert, and it explains how to obtain a sample ballot if they'd wish to have one. The kit itself contains instructions. It, it contains the voter information guide with the candidate statements and measures, and those are both printed separately, one in English and one in Spanish. 
There are two ballot cards, and I thank the board for the new voting system or else we would have been on three. The new voting system allowed us to keep the ballot cards to only two, which was a tremendous cost savings for us. There will be a return envelope, which now is green. Those will be bilingual as required by um, law. You'll see on the insert of the instructions, there is a new I voted by mail sticker that will go out to all registered voters. And I have to tell you, it's been the biggest excitement from the feedback from the voters is that they get a sticker even though they're not going to the polls. Oh, so you, you could, uh, I'm sorry. oh, geez. That, <laughs> I'm sorry. So if you see someone walking around with three stickers on their lapel, uh, <laughs> you voted for the whole family. <laughs> Okay. Okay, continuing on, and I will answer questions at the end. So continuing, Alan, I, like I at least got your attention. That's nice to know you guys are hearing me up here. Um, so the vote by mail options, the voters have options. Uh, there are three of them. They may use the voting kit that we mail to them. On election day, they may go to the polls and surrender that ballot and vote a precinct ballot. Um, or they can come to our office and they can vote in person on the new uh, ballot marking devices that we have in our office. Polling place voters will receive a purple kit, and that's distinctive to make sure that we know that they're polling place voters as opposed to vote by mail voters. On these inserts, we will have the polling place location on the back, just like it was on the sample ballot. This will be on the back of that insert telling the voters where they can go vote. This kit will have all the same items as a vote by mail packet. The difference will be it'll have a facsimile sample ballot as opposed to a vote by mail uh, ballot. And the application is also incorporated in the return envelope. Vote by mail voters have the option of on election day going to the polls and that they're assigned to and vote on election day. They may convert their facsimile sample ballot in from their voting kit into a vote by mail ballot. The polling place voters may come to our office and vote in person or Angela, early vote. one second, please, Supervisor Rivas. Hey, Angela, the one question I have is the vote by mail voting options mm -hmm. that you just showed. Um, is so those are the three options is an option not to drop it off in that box outside absolutely and i'm going to get to that as okay. we we're just getting to how to so vote anyone then. anyone can just drop it off in that box. absolutely and i'm going to clear that at the end and it's going to be a highlight because i love that box Thank it's you. my favorite <laughs> Okay, polling place voters have options to vote by mail. They do not have to. They have the option to vote by mail. And on page two of the insert, it gives the voters in the voting kit how to do that, a step-by-step. -step. The first step is that they would vote their facsimile sample ballot in either blue or black ink, just like a regular vote by mail voter. They would then convert uh, the vote by the voted sample ballot to a vote by mail by removing the stub that is on that ballot. That identifies it as a facsimile ballot. They would complete the return envelope, which is a combination application to vote and a return envelope. This together makes it a, a vote by mail ballot. When they complete that envelope, no postage is required for any voter now to return their vote by mail ballot, whether they are a polling place voter and use the conversion kit or if they're using the green one, which is uh, for standard vote by mail voters. Also, the I voted by mail sticker will be included in these kits. Okay, there are three simple ways to return a vote by mail ballot. The first one is to drop it off at our drop box, which is between the library and our office. That drop box will be opened when early voting starts. Also, they can drop it off in a mailbox anywhere in the county or outside the county. Elections office, if they want to personally hand it to us, they can hand it to us at our office during regular office hours, or they can go to the polls on election day and drop it off at any polling place on election day. It does not have to be their polling place. Okay, a summary of the changes is to improve voter confidence, a single mailing of all voter information guides and voting kits, easy for polling place voters to become vote by mail voters in an all-in-one convertible sample ballot and return envelope application, reduce the confusion which we believe will increase voter participation, and there is no cost to return that vote by mail ballot. 
New uh, ballot processing procedures are increased office security. We have 24 hour surveillance on all of our voting equipment, our new voting equipment. Improved uh, transparency of ballot processing with the new uh, equipment. Increased internal auditing procedures to ensure one vote and one vote per voter and any attempt to vote more than once will be identified prior to counting of the ballots. Voting twice is a crime and we take it very seriously and we do refer to the DA when that does occur. That means we'll investigate those three stickers you talked about. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> well, you know, that I, I still think it, it, it's potentially a, a real big problem in households where you have four or five voters and one person goes gets gets the mail let me let me let me finish and then oh, okay I'll okay, okay. I hope so you. I have a solution too okay okay so we're going to reduce <laughs> costs by printing and postage only uh, from 52,000 to 30,000 that is the majority of why we're able to do these other things the reduction in staff time and processing applications is going to be enormous we're consolidating the application process into an all in one application and return ballot. Uh, complete cost and cost summary of the changes will be posted after the election audit and the impact of the new voting system. All of these changes have so many variables. I can't put an exact number on everything that's going to happen here until the end. The drop box opens on May 7th, and there is a picture right there, and I love that drop box. If you haven't utilized it, it is wonderful. It's under 24-hour surveillance, seven days a week, uh, all year long. So if people walk up to it and try to tamper with it, we can see it. It is locked at this time. It will be unlocked on May 7th. We tell everyone to smile and wave when you drop your ballot in the ballot box. We do have kids and parents that do that. It is lots of fun to watch. Early voting also begins on May 7th in our office, Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. to uh, 5 p.m. Also, we have early uh, weekend voting on Saturday and Sunday, only June 2nd and June 3rd from 9 to 3. The drop box, as I mentioned, is always open when voting starts. Election day office voting and polling place voting is on June 5th between 7 a.m. and 8 p.m. I want to thank you for letting us uh, speak today and do this presentation. We have many other changes that are happening in the office, but I want to group them into highlights so that I don't take too much of your time. But also, I'd like to address the chair's questions about how we are handling um, security and ensuring that each voter is only voting once. So if I can take a moment. Um, what we do in our office when it comes to vote by mail voting is if you are a vote by mail voter, you're automatically flagged as receiving a ballot and you will be noted on the roster at the polls that you have received a vote by mail ballot. If you go to the polls to vote and you don't bring your ballot, you have to vote provisional. We've, we research that ballot and ensure that your vote by mail wasn't returned before we count that provisional. That's how we make sure there's no way that you're voting twice as a vote by mail voter. If you vote at the office and then go to the polls and attempt to vote, we will only count the one that's received first and processed, which is the one that's, count that's in our office. That provisional at the polls would not be counted and we track all of those. We also compare how many people try to attempt to do that. It is not as high as you would think. Normally it is seniors that forget that they voted. Um, additionally, with the new convertible sample ballot option, what happens with that is as voters utilize that all-in-one process, they will be flagged in our system as a early voter. When they're flagged in our system as an early voter, they will also appear on the roster as an early voter and be treated exactly like a vote by mail. Meaning if they try to go to the polls and vote, they will also have to vote provisional only the first ballot in will be counted. So if it's the convertible uh, ballot that's a vote by mail, or if it's the provisional, only the first ballot in will be counted. Now, if a voter chooses uh, to just vote at the polls as a polling place voter and not a mail ballot, they do not have to do anything. They just go in there and they vote a regular ballot. 
What happens is after we print that roster that says who has already voted or received a vote by mail ballot, we stop processing all polling place voter, um, the purple applications, because we have to ensure that there is no one that voted twice. So we process all those polling place ballots from election day. We do a vote no vote, which we go through and every one of those rosters we identify in our system who already voted. Then we compare that digitally through our electronic system who has returned a vote by mail ballot through that courtesy system and then we pull those if anyone attempted to try and vote twice and they would be rejected. Uh, at this point in time, we are excited about how this is going to make it easier for voters to participate, especially when they have last minute challenges and they're unable to get to the polls on election day. If they have this kit with them, as long as they drop that either in a mailbox and have it postmarked by election day and received by Friday, that ballot will be counted. They also can drop it off at any polling place now in the state. Any questions? If we well just, covered. If I, uh, if I could just uh, follow up with a comment that every vote by mail ballot, you must sign the back of that ballot. So if five ballots go to a specific home, we're verifying those signatures. So if one person is signing every ballot, we'll know about it. Oh, okay. That and, helps. And additionally, yeah. in order for it to be a valid ballot, it has to be the ballot, the completed envelope, sealed. It, the ballot by itself, vote by mail or the convertible sample ballot, is nothing without the envelope completed with the voter's signature. Those two together sealed and validated by our office, and we signature check every one of them. We don't just compare it to your signature on record with the voter registration. We compare it to scanned images of your past signatures from prior ballots when you've signed the envelope. So it takes the two of them to become one, and neither of those are valid at the polls. If you try to put either of those ballots in a ballot box, they will be polled and not counted because they're identifiable. Okay, Supervisor Dale Cruz. It's a scenario. Um, I'm a vote, vote at the polls person. Okay. 805, I come to your office to vote. Will you give me a ballot to vote at the office? 805? Yeah. Were you in line before 8 o'clock? Nope. No, you will not get to vote. I will, I will not be able to vote at your office? No. Nope. You have to be at my office by, by 7.59. No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. 9, 9, 10 in the morning on Tuesday. Oh, if you, so if you go to the polls and you vote and you're a polling place voter and then you come to my office, you're getting one of those purple ones and they're held and not opened until after we validate the vote no vote from the polling so place. anyone that goes to your office will get a purple one. They'll get a purple one. Okay, perfect. Okay, that solves the scenario. Okay, thank you. That's great. Okay. Uh, uh, please, um, uh, one second. I'm, I'll open it up for a public comment and then you could ask your question then. Thank you. Uh, any other comments or questions from the supervisors? Anyway, that that was uh, very well done, and you know, I was going to uh, mention that um, some of the the vendors that we deal with in in, in the uh, elections, the printer, um, and our um, our voting system uh, vendor, they have all commented about that this you know this plan is um, you know very exciting news. Uh, for not only the county, but uh, for the future of voting. We are patent it. Um, I'll open it up for uh, public comment, ma'am. Oh, please come to the podium if you can, please, uh, and introduce yourself for the record. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Nancy Martinez, and I have a couple quick questions in regard to the ballot and how it's done. So. In looking at it, and I'm just looking at this as a printing type person, I see that you have the voter's name, address there. So that's going to be variable data that's going to be put in and with the printing company with each and every one. So on the return envelope, are they also going to have the person's name printed already on it as variable data? Can I yes, that? please, please. <laughs> okay, so let me speak to this See, this how this is, is going to work is that's a window envelope. Correct. What she's looking at is a window envelope. That information is already printed on the return envelope one time. It's not printed twice. It's printed one time. It has a voter identification number, so we know it's only specifically qualified for a specific voter. It also has a barcode. It has the election information also. Okay, so you have a micro barcode at the bottom. Is that how you're identifying it to the not, person? No, you, you're seeing just a visual. This would have more data on there that is for validation purposes. I understand yeah. that. 
Um, I actually do that for a living. Right, but, so, <laughs> but on the return envelope on the exterior here, not the front. Okay, oh. the front but would on not On the return have envelope, so it will be anyway, here and you will um, have a code. I, I, I kind of want to keep this mm -hmm. as kind of a public comment directed to the board. And there's and just we'll one other thing, questions. because in looking at the cost that you're saying with this, and then you say that you go back and you have to have each signature validated, it would probably behoove the county to just have all of the signature cards Scanned. They are. Okay, and then go through and it validates all, them one at a time. All digital. Okay, because I thought you said people actually go in and look at them. We have to. Want me to? To respond. Okay. Sure. All right, thank you. Yeah. So signature checking is done through humans. It's not done right now in our county through a digital scanning system. All the images are scanned and all of the signature validated through a procedural process in our office. There are systems that do scan signatures. Those normally are about $250,000. If the board is willing to purchase one for us, I would be very happy. There are other ways to do that, to send them to a company such as Xerox Corp. They do it, they scan it, they then put it so that you can actually send yours through and it will identify mismatches. I just thought it might be cost effective for the county in the long run. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Anyone else from public would like to comment? Hi, good morning. Uh, Steve Rosati, county resident. Um, I'd just like to make a couple of comments that the elections department and uh, the staff and um, especially the uh, elections advisory group meetings that are held, um, all of them are just doing a really good job. It's a superb job ensuring that um, the voting process uh, is updated, runs smoothly, and follows uh, voting statutes. Um, their work and tweaking of the voting procedures um, are just a great benefit to our community um, and are just evident from, from the update that you got today from Joe Paul and, and Angela. The ease in voting in the future should really increase voter participation. I mean, there's no more reasons for not voting. Um, it's going to be much more easier to, to vote from the comfort of our own home now. Um, dropping off the ballots or a piece of cake, I suppose, if you don't even want to leave your house, you can put it outside if you feel safe, you know, to have it picked up from your front yard. Um, at no cost. So with all the cost savings, I mean, and that's really important. You know, the, the voters, we all want something for nothing. And I know um, to, to mail something like that would be a couple of bucks, I would imagine, because of the size of it. Um, so we, we should be pretty happy about that. Um, I would hope that education of the public um, at various levels would at, at least help increase 15 percent at a minimum. Maybe I don't know. I, I, Fifteen percent. We get pretty good turnout as it is, and I just think this should be at a minimum. I mean, I think it's going to surpass that. Um, I just like maybe some comment made about just just the cost of uh, the mailing and processing of a vote with the new system, and then what was the old system's cost? Just as do as a comparison. Um, to the election staff, and then from the board level, if there always be, seems to be concerns on the off, the, I guess what you call it, the odd years, you know, not voting, and I'm just wondering if because today you've experienced difficulties in coming to terms with having similar votes on the same ballot, if this is a cost-effective method and maybe a smaller vote, if you only have one or two things to vote on, maybe that would reduce the cost a little bit more. That might help um, get procedures in place to financially benefit the county uh, instead of having to wait two years, you know, from, from that, you know, like the transit occupancy tax, uh, if you're afraid to put that on at the same time or whatever, you got three, three or four taxes, you know, you could do it over a period of two years if this is cost effective. So that'd be something I'd like to hear from the board to see if that's a possibility. Okay, thank you. Any other comments from the public? Seeing none, uh, bring it back to the board. Any final comments or thoughts? Thank you, um, the elections department, for a great presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, County Council, closed session.
Number 15, closed session conference with legal uh, counsel uh, anticipated litigation, initiation litigation pursuant to D4, government code section 54956.9, number of cases 1. 16, closed session conference with legal counsel, existing litigation, subdivisions A and D1 of section 54956.9, Hollister School District versus County San Benito, uh, Superior Court of California, County San Benito, CU 170085, 17. Um, all these are under the same code section, subdivision A and D1 of section 54956.9. Name a case, Gabriel S. Can be Escondido versus County San Benito Superior Court of California, case number CU 17 00067. Next case, N. Yen versus Paul Burns at Al Superior Court of California, County San Francisco, case number CGC 17 562114. Next case is Nancy Martinez versus County of San Benito, uh, United States District Court, case number C, I meant 3. Uh, colon 15 CV 00331 JST and last case Del Real versus County of San Benito United States District Court for Northern District of California case number 517 CV 06859 NC and okay great thank you we can knock it all out before lunch I can. we can knock at least okay good some of them there, <laughs> see if there's anybody here that wishes to comment is there anybody that wishes to comment on any of these cases? Pardon me? Is, is there anybody that wishes to comment on any? Yes, anybody who wants to comment on any of the items uh, for closed session? Okay. Uh, seeing none, thank you. Thank you. We're going to do the first one. John, we're going to do the other one first. Sorry.